if you can focus on the problems that users or customers or clients are having and tailor your solution to alleviate that problem, then there's immediate value. Business of Architecture, episode 338. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Business of Architecture is the leading business consultancy that helps you structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today's show is also sponsored by Layer App, the flexible database for architects that makes it easy to view and share photos, files, and project data right in Revit. Get a completely free 14-day trial to go check it out by visiting layer.team forward slash B-O-A. That's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot team, T-E-A-M forward slash B-O-A. Today is a sponsored interview with Zach Soflin AIA. Architect Zach Soflin is the founder and CEO of Layer, a powerful software tool that speeds up your design and drawing workflow. It's really a remarkable application. After a decade of practicing and leading computational design initiatives, he created the software application Layer to change how architects leverage building data for better efficiency, transparency, and profitability. What I really love about Zach's story is that this company, which is up and coming and has a bright future, was generated out of some of the difficulties and challenges that he experienced as an architect. And that's going to be a theme we're going to be touching on for several of our next episodes, which is how can you as an architect or Perhaps you own a firm, perhaps you don't own a firm yet, perhaps you're happy working and building a firm where you're part of a team. In any case, how can you focus on the challenges and problems that you're seeing in the world and be able to come up with an innovation, innovative solution to those problems? That's exactly what Zach is doing currently, and I'm sure you'll enjoy our conversation here together. You can learn more about Layer and get a free trial of this powerful tool by going to layer.team. So that's layer, just like layers in AutoCAD or layers on a cake, dot team, T-E-A-M. Welcome, Zach. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Enoch. So there was a problem that you were seeing in the architecture industry in the course of your career. Tell us what was the problem that you were experiencing? Yeah, so um, uh, I, uh, I was an architect uh, for about eight years prior to founding Layer. Um, at a firm called BVH Architecture. Uh, one of the projects we were working on there uh, was for the Nebraska State Capitol. Um, a fairly iconic building, something that uh, obviously has a lot of history involved in it. And so this project in particular was a, was a 10-year HVAC replacement project. So we had to go into the entire building, rip out the old HVAC equipment and replace it with brand new. And obviously there's a lot of patching and repairing that goes along with that. So. Um, part of that project is we had to go in and actually do a detailed condition assessment and survey uh, of the entire building. So um, uh, how we would traditionally approach this is we would print out kind of the information that we were gathering onto forms. We'd walk into a room and we'd gather the information about that room, you know, what the wall material is, what the condition of it is, um, and then proceed to take photos with our digital camera. leaving us kind of with a, with a pile of papers when we got back to the office and a pile of digital photos where hopefully we could kind of find what we were looking for months or even years down the road when it came to actually utilizing that information. So um, initially we knew that like the scale and multiplicity of this project was going to be so massive that um, it was going to necessitate a different solution. Um, so I, uh, as, a, as a project architect on the project, I started kind of looking at different solutions we could come up with um, and didn't really find any existing um, and so uh, uh, I ended up building a, a prototype uh, of, of kind of an idea I had, which was uh, essentially connecting all this real world data, like photos, notes, tasks, field data, things like that, connecting all of that to um, the 
um, production software we're actually designing in, which in this case was Revit. So that's kind of how that all started. We hadn't really intend to intended on launching a, a product at all. Um, we just were trying to solve uh, the problem that we had on this really, really large uh, project. So, yeah, I get it. Well, let, let me pause you there. So, and probably a lot of our listeners tuning in today have, have had this experience of working on a large problem or a large yeah. project going in, having to do the, the as built, having to take pictures of existing conditions. And let's face it, we all know what it's like to go back to the office. And then you have your digital camera there, you upload it. And then maybe you took pictures of the room numbers on the doors so you could remember which rooms you were in. Maybe you forgot a couple, you know, yeah. now you have to remember is that the east, the west, the, the south, the north wall. Hopefully you did it in the right sequence, but then you have all these folders that you need to then categorize these on the hard drive, rename all the files. I mean, the paperwork involved and just the organization involved is just like a huge administrative headache. So yes. I'm imagining with this huge project that you had, that was probably the case. I mean, you told me there were how many windows and, and kind of get, tell yeah, us, help so, us understand the size of this project. Sure. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the, the building itself was made up of about 1300 rooms, um, 1100 windows or so. And so we had to do a detailed survey of rooms and windows. Um, all told, I think we gathered about 100,000 pieces of unique data. So information about windows and rooms, we gathered about 100,000 pieces of unique data, um, along with about 39,000 photos. So massive, I mean, huge, huge pile of, of information to sort through. It, and people have been doing this for years and years and years, let's face it, and yeah. dealing with this. Uh, what, what was different for you that made you actually want to look for another solution other than the way it's been done in the past? Well, we need we knew that we had that. I mean, we, we had spent a couple hundred hours building this really detailed um, Revit model, uh, uh, you know, 3D digital model of the entire building. And so geometrically, we had uh, all the necessary complexity we needed to design, right? Like uh, we had all of the measurements we needed so we could go into a room and we could, you know, design a solution without having to go back and digging through folders or anything else like that. Well, that isn't the case with like this um, ancillary, like real, real world data, like photos, um, condition, uh, um, data, uh, notes and tasks, things like that. When there you say no condition data, do you mean the, the state of the condition of the equipment, the materials that tell, tell yeah. me what? Yeah, exactly. So, um, for example, a room, we would, we would document not only what the wall material was, but, um, what the condition of that wall material was, whether it was preservation worthy or not, meaning was it was it in a state where we needed to make sure that we were preserving preserving it or um, could it be potentially replaced in the future? So all of those things are, are things that we couldn't, you know, inherently embed in our model. But so we had this really smart model geometrically, but it was lacking all of this information that we actually needed to design. So um, the idea there was to shorten the gap between the information that we need to design and the tool we're actually designing in. Um, and for us, like a 10 year project, you know, a lot of people on this project team, um, any shortening between the information needed and the tool they're designing in is huge efficiency gains for us. And so um, uh, that was that was something, an objective that uh, if we could find a solution to it uh, would save us, you know, tons of time. And now let's say, let's say, so a designer, let, let's go back in time, pretend like Lair wasn't around, you didn't have this great tool. Uh, you're a designer, you're working on the project, you need to now pull up some of that information and get some of it. What would be the old way of having to get that information to make sure that you're making the right indications on the drawings? Yeah, good good question. So um, uh, we're probably all kind of familiar with what that process uh, traditionally looks like with, you know, basically when you get back to the office, uh, yeah, like you said, whether you took photos of room numbers and then proceeded to take photos of that room or whatever it was, um, you had some type of system, hopefully, for how you were gathering um, that data. And then when you got back to the office, you needed to, you know, create new folders on your server um, for each individual room or each individual piece of equipment or window. Um, and so uh, you would obviously download all the photos, separate them out into folders, um, and again, hope that you remembered correctly or that you didn't um, put something in the wrong place or whatever else when you're actually looking for the information that you need, you know, months or even years down the road sometimes so um tradition and that's that's how we, we we've uh, bbh has specialized in preservation for um uh, decades and uh, that's the way we've always traditionally done it like there okay. there really hasn't been a better way 
So now, now you're a designer, you have that information, it's on the computer hard drive. Your task is now to create the drawings or the design from that. What do you have to do now on the design side? Yeah, exactly. So then at that point, um, as far as, as far as, uh, um, the design side, when you're in, in this, this project is a little bit different in that, um, we were designing unique solutions for each individual room because of the nature of the project. Um, obviously that's going to, that's different for every project, but, um, for this particular project, we, you know, as we got to a room to design it, um, we would have had to go on our server, um, look up that folder for that particular room, look through the photos, um, pull up the scanned form where we took our notes. Hopefully we could read our teammates' uh, handwriting um, or uh, our own handwriting for that matter, in my case. Yeah, um, and, <laughs> good point. Uh, uh, then, then translate that to some type of design. So for example, you know, if, if we're needing to punch a hole through a wall, what, you know, and I, I'm, I'm in Revit and I'm um, looking at that particular wall, what's the material there? Do I need to worry about preserving it or taking necessary steps to protect um, uh, it, you know, above and beyond what we normally would, those types of things. So just to find out that little piece of information um, can sometimes take um, six or seven steps, you know, into our server and uh, uh, handwritten notes and things like that. So, so, I mean, basically what I'm hearing is that the local Starbucks or the local coffee machine would be busy because let's face it, to be a designer and having to pull up these things and look at them and, and analyze them and cross check and go back and forth and make sure the right to, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that puts some people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. <laughs> oh, geez. Now, uh, heaven forbid you get something wrong because you're cross-eyed from having to look at so many different, you know, yes. notes and data or trying to decipher our own ha handwriting as you state, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. So it's quite a big problem. You were feeling the pain. And like I said, what was it that, that prompted you to say, mm, maybe there's a better way of doing this? So... Revit, Revit itself as a, as a tool um, is is uh, a BIM software, building information modeling, and and the whole idea is that you can connect data um, to geometry, right? Like, um, and so Revit has things like parameters where you can store information, you know, attached to doors and windows and stuff like that. I'm sure most of us are familiar with kind of how those um, parameters work. And so my initial thought was. What, what if we were able to just connect, you know, uh, uh, richer parameter types like, you know, um, libraries of images um, to a particular room's um, parameter or, um, uh, you know, be in the field and, uh, jot, you know, gather information about its material and it populate into Revit instead of having to translate all of that information over to populate room finish schedules and things like that. And so that's kind of where the initial idea came from is how do we like layer on, you know, add a layer of data um, uh, on top of these elements that are already somewhat smart. How do we, how do we um, add, a, add an additional level of uh, um, awareness or uh, um, intelligence? And what did the first product look like, uh, meaning the technology-wise? What, what tools did you piece together to be able to do this? Yeah, um, it, was, it was actually a, just an app I uh, uh, hacked together over um, nights and weekends, um, after, I don't know, it probably took, uh, uh, a week to kind of pull together an initial kind of prototype. And that's when I initially kind of showed the team, um, what I wanted to, to try. And everyone was surprisingly receptive to it. Um, uh, BVH, I mean, I, I have to give kudos to, to BVH in that, um, uh, that is a lot of trust, um, in a, <laughs> in a young architect to entrust, um, the data gathering of, uh, all of this information that, you know, takes hours, days, weeks um, for us to gather um, to be able to store it in a, in a system that, that we, we um, put together. And so there's an there's a element of bravery for sure that, <laughs> that uh, went into this, at least from BBH's side, because um, that's essentially how it worked. We, I pulled together the prototype, the team was on board and excited about it, and um, so I continued building it while we kind of used it in the field. And so that created all kinds of... Um, interesting situations but um ultimately it was an it was an awesome process and i mean there, there's there's no better way to uh, to kind of go about building a product than um working directly with the people using it uh on or a being one basis. of them right yeah exactly yep both yeah. so it was a it was a great way to kind of start and again we hadn't really intended on using this beyond the capital at all i mean basically we were um we we're planning on just using it specifically for the capital there was no plan to commercialize it at all so 
um, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a cool process. Got it. Well, you're, you're an architect. I mean, are you trained in software development? How did you put together an app, even a rudimentary app? Um, no, so I, I'm not trained as a computer science, uh, computer scientist. I didn't, um, haven't done any formal training in, in that area. Um, during my, during my, uh, a college career, I, I uh, um, focused on data-driven architecture as kind of my thesis um, on my, my last year of school. And during that time, I really, I really dove in and took an interest in um, digital design technology and um, uh, how we can start to apply uh, um, new technology to our design processes. So um, I would say that's really where like my interest started. And so then I've continued to kind of build that um, all while still kind of practicing um, and it kind of uh, uh, um, ended up that this was this was something that I, I just kind of pulled together, and it was definitely like a learning experience the entire way along. Um, uh, thankfully, there, there's a lot of tools out there today that that um, uh, really really change the game as far as uh, the, the the level of experience you need in order to get into something like this. Um, Especially with web technologies, there is um, all kinds of opportunity out there for um, users to uh, get in and um, build something even without formal experience. Now, I, I don't want to say that. I mean, it, it, it. I didn't just jump into it and and build something day one or anything else like that. It took a lot of learning and a lot of practice um, over years, but. Um, uh, it's, it's amazing all the resources that are out there today to help you kind of learn the skills necessary to, to do something like that. Got it. And so that first initial prototype, when you, you saw the problem and you decided to develop a software solution for it, was there some sort of programming course you took? Did you do a Google search and guide it to, you know, here's some software to help you make your app? What, what was that? How does someone do that? <laughs> Yeah, it was a, it was a lot of googling. <laughs> um, uh, basically, I, I I kind of knew what I wanted the end result to be um, for for the app, and so uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of um, googling and trying to find the best framework to start in. And then once I kind of found what direction I wanted to go with it, it was a lot of um, understanding how that framework works and was was pulled together. Um, uh, and so again, no no formal course or anything else like that. It really just was. Uh, um, searching the internet for the problems as I ran into them <laughs> got and, it, got uh, it. working okay. out from there. So amazing. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, now you, you, you guys have a product, you have a software product. I mean, you're, you're getting users. Um, you're probably making millions of dollars, right? You've already bought your beach house. <laughs> um, Not quite. Elon Musk, here you come. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> now we, uh, we, we decided to launch, uh, um, this is a formal product after the, the capital, uh, project. Um, decided, you know what, this is, and, and really it was an exercise for us. Like we, we built this, we built this tool to do this one thing on the Capitol, but, um, uh, it just so happened that like, as we were, as we were wrapping that up, uh, we realized pretty quickly, we were like, you know, if we abstract this a little bit and focus on like what the key value propositions were like that this app delivered, um, to our team, um, this is really applicable to almost any design project and for that matter any any building project um, whatsoever um, and so what we did is we kind of abstracted uh, the, the the problems um, identified like the key value propositions and then we rebuilt it from the ground up knowing that this is this is the problems that we're wanting to solve um, for the industry uh, and so when you say we, Zach, excuse me, at that point, does that mean you went out, you hired some, some front end designers, you went out and hired some programming staff at that time? Tell me what that looked like. Sure. So um, actually, um, I, I continued to rebuild it myself. At that point, I um, gained even more experience. And so I guess I uh, um, to torture myself by doing it all over again. But um, uh, I, wow. uh, I, I rebuilt it uh, from the ground up. And then we also did... Um, we, we had a, without getting too far in the weeds, we, we have a Revit add-in, which is an integration into Revit. Um, and uh, that part of it is probably the, the part that I was least familiar with and was definitely the most kind of hacked together. <laughs> and so we took that and used that as kind of a prototype and took that to um, a development partner who um, actually proceeded to build that part of it out for us and uh, um, so that we could launch it commercially. So... Um, uh, at that point, we, we, we had engaged that, that, um, that development partner to, to come in and help with our add-in. 
um, and then I continued to build um, out the rest of the the app uh, to bring it to market. So we launched are, back in April of 2019. So got it, got it. April of 2019. Yeah. So right now we're just over a year of having mm-hmm. been launched. Yeah. Yep. Yes. What cool. are some of, and when was the first prototype? Um, did that take? Timeline's always messy in my head uh, with, yeah, with that. But that, yeah, I, I think uh, back in 2018 is when we, okay. we started on that. I think the beginning yeah, so of the about year. about a year before that. Okay. Yep. So it sounds yeah. pretty, pretty quickly. And what, what are some of the top lessons that you've learned from this process, which is, you know, let's face it, different from architecture in a lot of ways? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I think, I think some of the, some of the biggest were, um, as far as like solving problems, if you can solve someone's, uh, problem on a daily basis, whether it's in, whether it's through design, um, of buildings or designing, um, any type of, uh, software or anything else in this world, if, if you can focus on, um, uh, the problems that users or customers or clients are having, um, and tailor your solution to, um, uh, um, alleviate that problem, then there's immediate value. Um, and so obviously we do that on the design side uh, all the time uh, by, by taking information from our clients and translating it into designs. Um, and the, the same was true again with, again, it was an invaluable process for us to be able to walk side by side with the people actually using it and identifying, you know, what's actually valuable and what's not. Um, it's really easy to kind of get into, uh, um, you know, focus mode when you're designing a product and, you know, assuming, making assumptions about what users want. But um, uh, there's a lot of surprises when you actually open up and talk talk to users. So really understanding who your customer is, um, again, is, a, is, a, is an important value that really spans, the, spans industries, right? It's not just in product development, it's not just in design, but um, in anywhere. Yeah, and speaking of that, there's a lot that goes into building a software product. You make it sound so easy, but along the way, you're dealing with finances, fundraising, you're dealing with managing projects, managing programmers, uh, you're hiring team members, doing the marketing, doing yeah. the selling. What would yeah. you say would be one or two of the top lessons that you've learned from growing this company to the stage where it's at right now? Yeah, good good question. Um, I think like one of the biggest lessons that we kind of ran into almost immediately when we decided to take this to market was clearly defining like who our customer was. Um, that was probably one of the more um, uh, um, like ill-defined um, things early in our journey is we were we kind of knew what problems we were solving. Like I said, we kind of abstracted the problems and, and understood them to be, um, uh, you know, under, understood what they were. but. Um, it took us a while to actually connect with uh, other customers beyond our walls, our walls being BBH's walls. Um, so that, that's one of the things that I think I would have done a lot earlier on is engage uh, people from outside of um, uh, BBH and uh, how they practice. Because when you're, I, I don't know if this is this is specific to me, but I'm sure I have a, I have a hunch that everybody kind of feels this way. But um, uh, I, I kind of, as I was practicing in BVH, I, I kind of figured, okay, this is how most people execute projects um, uh, and go through projects. But the reality is there is a wide, wide variety of how people go about uh, projects. A lot of it has to do with scale. A lot of it has to do with, you know, the team members you have, the tools you're using, all of that stuff. But um, uh, I think getting a wider understanding of, of who our customers were early on was something that I wish we would have done earlier. I think one of the things that was confirmed for us uh, early on is that it's super important to find um, uh, good people, uh, people that fit well into your organization. Um, How did you learn that lesson? Do you have a story that you can share without uh, incriminating anyone? Or maybe with incriminating them? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. No, actually, um, we have had an amazing experience with um, the employees that we've hired. We're a team of six right now, um, and we've been we've been incredibly blessed with with the with the talent that we we have. Um, uh, it's kind of a, a wide range of. Uh, um, we have people that uh, business development guy who has um, experience in the startup world. We have. Um, uh, a marketing director who has experience in architecture but has never done anything like this but 
um, can anything is in like um, software, uh, but has the skills to learn quickly and, and produce. And we've got a development team that um, again hasn't hadn't had any previous experience in architecture in Revit, but have the willingness to learn and learn quickly and, and have the ability to do that as well. So like, I think like that's far more important than um, even uh, even finding people who, who check these specific boxes, um, people who are, are driven to kind of own their segment of the business um, and uh, um, take the initiative in um, pushing that part of your business forward, I think is um, something that we've really benefited from. And are you, are, is the company profitable at this point? No, we're, we're still, we're still an early stage company. Um, meaning that, uh, um, we've done, we've done a lot to, uh, 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 build out our product. And now we're just, we're just entering into that kind of growth, um, uh, phase where we've identified, we've, we've built kind of our, our product out. We've confirmed the pain points and the problems with customers. And now, um, we're working on scaling our business, um, side of things. Uh, Zach, you, you speak like a seasoned entrepreneur, but you've been doing it for maybe three years. What what resources or tools? I mean, did you get an MBA? Were you trained in business? Uh, have you taken online courses? I'm curious about what what's allowed you to uh, make the right moves that you've made so far. Yeah, um, no, I I, uh, I don't have I don't have any formal training in in uh, business or anything else like that. But um, I think uh, the uh, biggest and again this goes back to kind of what i was saying before um one of the one of the biggest values um for me is a willingness to learn and just um digest information i i uh am someone who just kind of goes out there and, and researches the heck out of um whatever i'm working on or whatever i'm passionate about um and so there's been a ton of great resources again like the internet is a is a great place to um, learn all all kinds of things if you find the right resources so um, there's a lot of authors that, uh, I've read as well that have really kind of helped, um, shape my perspective when it comes to the, the business side of a software company. Um, Eric Reese is one of them who, um, I've read a couple of his books, uh, on, uh, starting up and, uh, others. So there's a, a ton of great resources out there that, um, again, um, yeah, contribute to to my understanding of, of, of business. I mean, that, that's that's pretty meta because here we are on a podcast, which is going to be another great, hopefully a great resource for our listeners, right? <laughs> yeah, We're exactly. just all consuming yeah. <laughs> information now over the internet. Yep, well, exactly. Okay, great. So you have the, you have the product. Uh, you, you did the initial launch. Um, you have it out. It's a tool. It's feasible. It works now. What what kind of features does does Layer have? How does it facilitate? The, so we kind of talked a lot about the pain. How does it make it easy right now? Yeah, good, great question. So, um, Layer itself is a flexible database for project data um, that connects to Revit. So you can think of it um, uh, as, as a flexible tool um, where you can build out specific workflows for um, your uh, whatever your problems happen to be. So we have we have customers using this to um, just generally track project management and connect tasks and coordination issues directly to their model. We have clients who use this for. Um, uh, uh, FF and E, and you know, for, you know, uh, um, tracking um, equipment and uh, cut sheets and specifications, um, and connecting it back to their Revit model. So, um, Layer is is a is a uh, a flexible tool. Again, you can think of it like a database that allows users to kind of visually create um, their own uh, workflows and then collaborate with users uh, or, or uh, um, uh, team members on those projects. So, you can think of it like we. we we built this, um, this kind of originated from a condition assessment or a facility audit. Um, and the way that, the way that it kind of fleshes out with that is that, um, layer, which is an app for, um, iOS, Android, web, Mac, windows, we're, we're on basically every platform. Um, you can take layer and start to gather information like photos, notes, tasks, etc., And then when you come back to the office, um, all of that information is automatically attached to elements within your model. So you can kind of think of it like we're contextualizing all of this data to your model. So now when you're in your Revit model, you can begin clicking around on a room or a door or a window or a piece of equipment. And as you select that element or, um, you know, the room, the door, the window, um, layer automatically surfaces and pulls up all the information related to that item. So um, you could click on a room 
and you could see there would be a conversation, you know, happening specifically about that room, you know, about the design of that particular room. Um, you might assign a uh, task to your structural engineer to take a look at the specific column within your building. Again, all these pieces of data have context to your actual building elements. And so that, that's, I think, the biggest differentiating factor for us. Um, it's a really flexible platform. You can build out all types of workflows, but at the end of the day, you're connecting all of this data back to um, uh, your, your actual building elements, the model um, that you're actually working in. So let me let me make sure I understand this correctly. So I, I go to the job site with my smartphone, my smart device, whatever it happens to be. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a layer app for that. I pull up the layer app. I'm then able to take pictures through the app. I'm able to put memos down through the app. And then that connects seamlessly, automatically, and pairs it up with the Revit model because I've input the right information the first time. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it, it's, it's, it's fairly uh, flexible in how you can utilize it, meaning that you can actually you can actually gather information without a Revit model to begin with if you want to. You don't have to have the model completely built out. But then later on, we allow you to connect that data back um, to your model. Mm. Um, so it's pretty flexible in how you can use it. Yeah, great. And I think that's a great point, the flexibility, because I know the look, if there's an industry that likes to tweak things and do things differently, it's got to be yes. architects, you know, because I oh, work yeah, with yeah. a lot of them and every single one, they have a different file structure. They have a different naming structure. They do their drawings differently. You know, even yeah. though the, the parapet detail is the same, they all call it out differently. The callouts all look different. You know, the way they yep. do their notes all looks different. So I exactly. can imagine that that flexibility is going to be a big selling point because everyone's going to have their particular way they think they want to interface with the tool. And so to help our users, under, uh, our listeners today, help them understand, uh, you know, this flexibility allows you basically to, it's almost like a kit of parts, right? But very simple to use to where you can build out, like you said, a workflow or any functionality that you want very simply to custom tailor it to how you use the product. Is that a good description for how that works? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so without getting too far in the weeds, um, you can... You know, basically, we have a library of features and fields that we provide to you. Um, things like text inputs and toggle switches and um, all kinds of stuff. And so then basically, you take those, those parts and you can assemble your workflows. Like a punch list might have a uh, connection to a room within your model. Um, it might have a description field. It might have a status field where you assign a status, um, those types of things where you can create them. And then you might be able, you might have a field that actually connects it to a location on your floor plan or something. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the key is that that we built we built kind of the platform that allows users to um, uh, build out these workflows. And then now we actually are building out templates that then you can take these kind of best practice templates and and uh, utilize them and customize them to your liking. Now, so say for instance, could you use it for punch list like you were mentioning? Could you let's say that you you put the the data you have you have the app on your phone you go out to the job site oh this wall has some paint that needs to be fixed you can put that right into the app and then the designers know about it now or the office knows about it because it's linked up and there's some sort of report that you run later and they can keep track of those things is, is that possible yeah exactly yep um you can you can export all of your data um so whether it's to pdf or spreadsheet you could export your punch list you can also invite the contractor directly to uh your project and um they can actually collaborate with you. So um, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's uh, quite a few different ways that you could utilize that, but um, that's, that's one that we've seen quite a bit of use on is um, uh, the contractor can then go in and assign it to subcontractors. Subcontractors can track the status of that item, um, et cetera. So it uh, makes, it, makes it pretty straightforward. Is anyone using this for job site inspections? Let's just say job walks, you know, we don't really inspect, but let's say we go on a job walk and we're yeah. looking at, at the, you know, the column of details and all the fireproofing over here looks like it flaked off and you need to take a picture of that, you know, that kind of stuff. Or is anyone using it for kind of everyday CA tasks? Yeah, definitely. Um, we have people using it for RFIs, um, tracking RFIs. We've got it. people using it for, you know, like field notes, um, things like that where you're, um, you're you know, whether it's issue based or, or you know, a re report based, meaning you know, a certain day you just have a list of uh, reports. Um, that's that's one of the like that's one of the things we 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 focused on flexibility from the beginning, um, uh, which has been a huge benefit of like utilizing our product. But now what we're what we're what we're trying to do is is now backfill 
um, this flexibility with, with kind of the best practices. Because I'm sure what you're hearing and what your listeners are hearing right now is me saying, oh, it can do anything <laughs> for that matter. And the truth is you can do all kinds of stuff with it, but a lot of times that's intimidating for users. And so what, what we do is we, um, we provide you with an interface where um, you can select um, from our kind of best practice templates uh, what workflows you want to use um, and then connect those back to your Revit model. Um, uh, itself as you work. So um, hopefully we make it a little bit more uh, painless to kind of get started with those. Beautiful. And is this a tool that's, that would be for small firms or this is only for the large corporate firms that are doing these massive projects? Honestly, we've, we have both. <laughs> we have, we have uh, one person teams who, who utilize it um, and uh, um, we have uh, large enterprise uh, clients who are using it for specifically like Revit workflows um, uh, we have we have a lot of larger firms who use this for uh, specifically FF and E and um, equipment tracking and things like that. Even even medical equipment tracking. Basically, it's a it's a database of information that now you can connect to your model. So rather than putting in all of your product data for a stretcher um, um, into your model, you can now have a team member put all of that information into layer and then connect it back to your model uh, via layer. So we we. It, from small to large, it, it, it doesn't matter. We, we have users that um, use it in both. Um, usually the workflows look very different, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, they're, still, they're still getting um, value out of it. Zach, knowing what you know now, having gone through the startup process, running a tech company, uh, what, what lessons do you think you've learned that could be applied to the business of architecture? So if you're going back and running an architecture firm and being part of a firm, what are the lessons that you've seen from that side that you think could apply to what architects do? Yeah, I, w- I would say um, uh, uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think in general, um, uh, in the in the design side, but not only in design and operations and construction, um, we're we're relatively behind in like the technology that we're we're utilizing. Um, I mean, there's there's uh, uh, I mean. Revit obviously came on the scene back in the early 2000s, I think. Um, obviously, CAD was a big hurdle for people to get over. I mean, we're, we're still getting to that point of um, adoption of BIM, BIM tools, uh, even though it's uh, um, a technology that's been around for a really long time. But um, I would say looking to other industries and uh, the way that they work is something that I think we could learn a lot of lessons from. As an architect, it was it was refreshing kind of walking into the uh, tech world and seeing um, the systems that are in place uh, for managing uh, projects and building out products. Um, there is there's a lot of intelligence, kind of inherent intelligence in, in that industry and the tools that they're using. Um, and I think, I think architects could learn um, quite a bit from that. I know I did uh, when I um, kind of made the jump um, between there. So what, what's maybe a specific tool or, or workflow, maybe say from the project management side that the tech industry uses that architects could look into? I, I would say, well, even, I, I don't know about um, products, but I'd say like, I mean, just the way that, the way that they work is, is a, um, generally a really structured way. Again, without getting too far in the weeds, um, Git is kind of this um, uh, industry standard in the, in the tech industry where um, you, uh, it's, a, it's a process for, um, uh, revisions. So it's how teams of people can work on a product um, together without duplicating efforts or overriding data or anything else like that. Um, and the process itself is is uh, um, absolutely amazing. And when applied to architecture, if you're thinking about like um, revisions and, and whatnot, being able to see you know, down at a granular level who made what change, when they made it, and where they made it at, uh, I think is uh, something that would be really valuable. And I mean, obviously tools like Revit and, and others are, are, are starting to do similar things, but um, I think I think there's a lot we can learn about just like process management um, from the, the tech industry. And also just, just with, with general tools um, that are available um, for uh, uh, tech teams are now starting to be utilized by a lot of architecture teams. I mean, you can think about like things like Slack um, and others where firms are starting to adopt kind of these um, collaboration tools uh, that um, have been available for a while, but now um, are starting to make a lot more sense, especially with in this kind of 
post-COVID um, world, I mean, we kind of all need to figure out alternatives to work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where, where is Layer headed now? Yeah, so um, we're, like I said, we're kind of entering into um, uh, our kind of growth phase. We're focused on, you know, we feel like we have the product nailed down. We've got a clear roadmap for where we're going. Um, and so really we're looking for um, uh, partners to kind of help us uh, um, travel along that journey. We're, we're excited to um, uh, grow um, into uh, other segments of the industry. Layer itself, like we, we've kind of focused on um, design as kind of the, the um, uh, phase of the building life cycle that we're focused on, but really we see Layer as a, as a common data environment for the bu entire building life cycle. So um, uh, we're working on you know, growing into the design industry and then working on how we can grow into areas like operations and uh, things like that. Amazing. Where should our listeners go to find out more about your software product and how it can help them? Sure. So um, you can go to our website, uh, layer.team. So uh, yeah, layer.team uh, is, the, is the website. And uh, the best way to get started um, for us is to either uh, start a free trial right there or um, you can schedule a demo and um, we'll sit down with you, kind of go through the, the product uh, itself. Um, we're, really, we're really focused on, um, again, staying close to the customers um, and uh, how they work because we, we feel like that makes us a, a, a better product. So um, that's one thing you'll kind of notice is, is uh, if you if just, if anyone decides to kind of move forward with us is um, we're, we're there um, to listen to your ideas and implement them into our product. We're, we're really excited to be able to provide a, a solution to um, uh, users that, that, that fit their needs. So that's the best way to get started. I think. Great. Well, Zach Soflin, thank you for joining us on the Business of Architecture podcast today. Thank you for sharing with us about your journey of not only starting a software product, but also the tool that you've helped develop uh, for the industry. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. It was a good conversation. Thanks, you, Nick. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Today's episode is also sponsored by Layer App. Layer App takes all of your project related data, photos, and files and makes them accessible with the click of a button right in Revit. So let me tell you how this works. It took me a while to get the concept. Uh, say that you go to a job site and you take a bunch of pictures. Now, you get back to the office with your camera loaded down with hundreds, perhaps even thousands of pictures, and now it's your job to organize them in a way that makes sense so you and other team members can easily find and use them later. What a nightmare. Now, imagine instead that instead of wrestling with categorizing photos and renaming them and trying to organize them in folders, that the moment you took the photos on your smartphone, they were immediately linked to your Revit model where you or other team members could access them with the click of a button. This is what Layer App does. You can also link other project data like spec sheets, project notes, and anything else to elements right within Revit. So here are two reasons why I thought, as a listener, you'd want to try out Layer App. Number one, if you currently work for a firm, the last thing you want to be working on is tedious work like categorizing and organizing project information. If you're a firm owner or principal, your firm could save thousands in staff time just by using this app, not to mention the convenience of having project data at your fingertips right when you need it. I hope this is a valuable resource for you. If you use Revit, Layer App is a must-have. Find out more and get a completely free 14-day trial at layer.team forward slash BOA. It's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot T-E-A-M forward slash BOA. And by the way, if you listen to episode 338, you can hear my interview with Zach Soflin, the founder and CEO of Layer App, the architect turned software developer who created the product. 
and get your free trial at layer.team forward slash B-O-A. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.